total reclaim reclamation project within less than 30 days. And so the battalion was uh, felt good about itself after we got the right leader. So a lot of it was bound up in the uh, talents of the leader uh, and the uh, get, get, getting the group to coalesce when, in fact, the raw material was perfectly all right. This thing was salted with uh, very good officers. If I look back at uh, the people that were in the battalion and the division artillery at the time, it got to be a fairly close-knit division artillery. Uh, guys like Bill Bertishaw, uh, Frank Palermo, Vernon Lewis, uh, those are some names, all of them made general. And they lieutenants then? Pardon? Were they all lieutenants then? They were all lieutenants. Well, how about the battalion exec? Where did he, when you first got there, the three didn't know his job and the... Exec was out uh, picking up paper and he's a non-entity. Uh -huh. So your field grade crowd was not too good? Not much. Even though the colonel had commanded the battalion before? He had, in combat. Now you said there were two kinds of NCOs. There was the uh, ones who had gotten to quite senior rank in two or three years. And what was the other kind? Well, the, 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 the two classes of NCOs were a group who had stayed in uh, Korea to advance their personal interests and get rank, and they didn't know a lot. Then there was another, and so they were not, they, they knew how to get it, the job done in combat, but the business of training people well, they didn't know how to do that very well. Uh, it was sort of a survivorship operation in the Korean right. And the second group of NCOs was a very talented group of people that uh, then we went on and I was in the division for better than four years and uh, four and a half years, I guess, got there in 54 in April and left in September of uh, 58, so I was there four and a half years. And, and that group, the, the really high quality people, uh, were really first class NCOs and we went on to Germany and served in that unit. And they were, uh, there's a guy named Westerman, for example, uh, a guy named Saboteur, who later worked for me in the rocket unit. They were really terrific NCOs. So there was sort of a bipolar uh, group of very high quality guys and then some people that had made rank in uh, career really weren't worth it. And what did you do about those guys? Anything? Or what well, did it, turns, do it turns out that there's another episode that begins in 1955 which is uh, the going to Germany, the gyroscoping of the division of Germany. And we had been identified as the unit that would go and replace the uh, 5th Mech Division, which was located at that time in southern Bavaria, Munich, Augsburg. And so when that occurred, Wayne Smith, now still the division commander, had the had to line up the NCOs to go to Germany. He didn't take the just the division as it was. No, it, it it had a it had an infusion of people to try to get it. You had to volunteer to go there. I mean, it, that is to say. The division wasn't ordered lock, stock, and barrel to go there. And oh, by the way, there were NCO deficiencies. And then you got into the business of re-enlisting so that you had three years to do in Germany. Okay. So you could spend the whole tour. Okay, so you couldn't go unless you had three years. That's right. Okay, so that meant some of the, your AIT people wouldn't go. Wouldn't go. Right. And some of your NCOs would be coming up. They'd be coming up on enlistment. ETS. You had to encourage them to enlist or they could walk off. 
I'll never forget it as long as I live. Wayne Smith came down and he brought with him a mobile sewing machine team from the QM on the post with a stack of stripes. And we had a meeting in the uh, orderly room. Not the orderly room, but in the day room. And he came into our day room and he said, with all the NCOs, he said, we're going to Germany. I need people to sign up for three years. Anybody that wants to re-enlist for uh, Germany for three years, if you will do that, I will promote you from your current grade, one grade, and then I will make you an acting one grade higher. Holy so, and he said, if you sign the paper today, the sewing machine is outside and we'll sew the stripes on today. So here is a guy that walked in a room as a sergeant, uh, let's say a uh, staff sergeant, and came out as a, uh, see, walked in as an E, walked in as a buck sergeant and came out as an E7. Now, uh, and this, and with, with, maybe no, still with no disrespect now, you understand, there was not an NCOES program going on ad interim. Right, so he maybe had three or four years service. I mean. That's right. Mm -hmm. So he went from grade E5, he could be a section chief, grade E5, He'd be promoted to grade E6, which is really the rank for a section chief. But then he'd be given an acting promotion to grade E7. He could be a chief of smoke, which is a platoon leader. Yeah, and where the hell did you have the slots for all these guys? I mean, well, because he, they looked at the total number of people, and a lot of people didn't want to go to Germany for three years. Oh, I see. So there were a lot of vacancies yeah. then. So uh, get one for pay and then get another one for uh, for. Uh, Advancement. So then we really had a Duke's mixture of uh, talent to get ready to go to the uh, famous downtown Europe. And at that time, uh, we got an infusion of people from the, uh, they levied the 82nd. And when they levied the 82nd, we got all sorts of ash and trash in that. They just say, get the riffraff out of the 82nd. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a penal unit constructed to take people by prison train from Fort Campbell to uh, New York, put on a ship, prison ship overseas, prison train from uh, Bremerhaven down to uh, Augsburg, and they were then put in their uh, units over there. Yeah, I'm using the word prison is a little harsh, but a, uh, a uh, they from people the who were incarcerated. Yeah, okay, they were in the stockade then. That's right. Stockade train is better. Uh, so it was a uh, it was an interesting. Leave uh, the eleventh uh, airborne in the states. Totally. So these these excellent NCOs that you mentioned were they people? Some excellent NCOs. Yeah, yeah, they were. And had they been in the Second World War? Was no, they were all since Korea. Okay, so I mean, they were all, since the war, they were most, mostly Korean war veterans. Right. Where was the uh, sort of nexus of know-how in the battery? Uh, were the officers most the lieutenants? Were they guys who knew stuff, or were they just out of school? It's most of them were recently out of school. Uh, the battery executive officer in my battery was a West Point uh, class of 53. I had been NC State 53, but because I'd gone two basic officer courses and he'd gone to one, he got there before you did. four months ahead of me, five months ahead of me, and therefore he was the uh, battery executive officer. So the officers were thin. How about the lieutenant who took command of the battery? He was a uh, Korean War vet. Was he and West Point? No, no, he was an OCS guy. Had he served as in the M in Korea? Beg pardon? Had he been a, an enlisted man in Korea? Yeah. And then he served there as an officer as well? Yeah. 
Okay. So this, he still is only a couple of years ahead of you. He didn't have great right. depth in uh, No, see, because you were getting, let me give you, he was less than three years service. Right. Because you were getting promoted to captain with three years service. Oh, were you really? Uh, Darn. In other words, uh, the, uh, The time and grade for getting promoted from second lieutenant to first lieutenant was a year and a half. And then year three years as a first lieutenant, so four and a half years service. So he had less than four and a half years service. Okay. How about the Devardi staff? Do you have any contact with them that they Yeah, in fact I became I became the general's aide after a while, the Devardi commander's aide. In the summer of uh, 55. And uh, the Devardi staff had a, a very senior colonel as the uh, Devardi command, or Devardi uh, XO, a uh, very senior guy as a Devardi S3 lieutenant colonel. The adjutant had been in this uh, 187 Mafia. So The general who had been, who was the division artillery commander, was a very senior brigadier general. Uh, and uh, was he, he wasn't, he was not a professional paratrooper in any way, shape, or form. He'd been sent there to be a division artillery commander. In fact, he had put in his papers to retire. Was he Thomas Watson? No, no. That was later. He was, yeah, he's, he's later. This guy was Ralph Morris Osborne. And Osborne uh, had been the head of Pan Moon John, Operation Big Switch at Pan Moon John. And when Max Taylor was made the Chief of Staff of the Army, he wrote a letter to him, and I remember, because I was the aide at that time, and he got a letter right back saying, you're not going to retire, you're going to get promoted, because you didn't have to go through any boards at that time. So I want you to get promoted and you would go to Berlin. So he went to Berlin to be the commander in Berlin. But but he, he didn't know anything much about the airborne. He was a novice jumper when he came there. And I, I used to incite him to go out and make parachute jumps to, so he could get his senior wings. And uh, try to get mine too. But uh, he, he really didn't know a lot about airborne parachute operations. Did he know much about artillery? Average artillery. Very remote from it, though. How about the exec and the S3? The exec and the the S3 knew more about it because this guy Cowie or this guy uh, Felix was the S3, who later would come down and take over the battalion. Okay. And so he knew a lot about it, and he sort of kept it going. But I, recalling it, the other two guys were administrators and walk around looking at things, but they didn't know. Being able to put an imprint on the division artillery wasn't their bag. They, they were they were too old for it, yeah. if I could use that. Uh, they were in ceremonial positions more than in direct leadership positions. As I look later at battalion and brigade, or brigade commanders it's and Devardi commanders, I mean, just quite a different caliber of people. It's very different now. <clears throat> Well, the, this question I had before of where is the nexus of knowledge and who knew what the hell was going on, obviously the guy resided in a few, a few artillerymen. Now, now, Vern Lewis was one of those artillerymen who was a who was a first-rate artillery officer, and he had fought in Korea and uh, knew how to gun and did work quite well. At it. Our battery didn't have very good stable of real knowledgeable artillerymen. Uh, some non-commissioned officers. The chiefs of smoke in the main were pretty good. This is before that. This is a platoon, sir. Before the general before came Before the out. general exodus yeah. uh, to clean it out. But in the main, the uh, NCO Corps was probably pretty good at the uh, grade of uh, E6 from artillery knowledge. And at the uh, chief of section level, not so hot. Grade D5, weren't so hot. 
E4s occupying E5 belts. And everything was OJT. I mean, there weren't any schools like they are today for uh, skill bases, you know, as, as we look at it today in our non commissioned officer education system. Just didn't exist. It was all OJT and the battery. Right. I just wonder who, who, who was teaching who what, but it sounds like there were. Well, was, yeah, was Vern Lewis it, in your battery? He wasn't, was he? Pardon? Vern Lewis? No, he was in a battery next door to me. Was he the battery? Was he the commander? Yeah. He was the executive officer until he and the uh, battery commander had a fight. And so the next day they moved him to make him a battery commander of another battery. They moved him from executive officer to be a battery commander. So it was a... Uh, and your own battery commander liked to shoot the pistol, but didn't... Well, the first guy liked to shoot the pistol about four to six months after he, he uh, after I arrived there. He then departed and got a new guy. And the new guy was always scrambling. Because he was, yeah, very he, new. He was a scrambler. This was his first battery. Uh, he was not a real airborne guy. I mean, he had uh, gone to jump school to, to sort of get this job, and he didn't know much about being a he wasn't battery long. commander. He wasn't a very red hot battery commander. He goes on to retire later as a uh, colonel in the army. I think he commands the battalion, but it does go beyond that. And the battery commander never went beyond the battery commander. He retired out as a major captain? Yeah. Retired as a major. Uh, I always looked upon it. I might have been worth something if I'd had a decent battery commander. Uh, yeah, I was wondering about that because they were very scarce in those days. The one thing, though, that, that uh, service in the 11th Airborne Division did was there were spending four and a half years in it, being a uh, reconnaissance and survey officer, being a liaison officer to the infantry, which I was. I was a battalion liaison officer to the infantry, and. Uh, being a general's aide and then being a, a Devardi assistant to, and then later being a platoon leader in the Honest John. Uh, four and a half years service, I knew everything there was to know about a division. Very comfortable with that. Uh, because although I moved around in jobs, they were all inside the division. Right. So when people you know, people sort of look at it and say, geez, how'd you go back and command a battery or a battalion? It was easy. I mean, I... you have done everything else. I've done all that stuff, so you got to do that. But it, when the... Uh, what it looked like was, at the outset, the sort of train and retain idea is almost like the cohort system. But then it was all torn apart by this ETS business when you had to... Uh, gyroscope overseas. Gyroscope overseas. And that's very much so. Yeah. But then you got a new cohort for a period of three years. Okay. Except we had a we had a cohort that was a mixed breed cohort. One was a double promotion inside your own division, and then it was filled by the riffraff out of the 82nd Airborne Division. Did you keep any of your trainees? Yeah, some of them elected to stay in, but the vast majority of them were uh, people that were in for two years and wanted to go back to school or right. whatever they wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, and then we got a lot of riffraff in at the, at the bottom, which caused us later in the 82nd a tremendous amount of difficulty in Europe. Did, were you still the 11th Airborne when you went to Europe? Yeah. Okay. But now I had been up in the divisions, division artillery staff and I'd been the general's aide for three months. He got orders to go to... Uh, Berlin, and by that time we knew we were going to Europe, and I said, uh, so I went and said, I wasn't a very good journalist aide, because being a dog robber for somebody just wasn't my bag. And uh, the uh, upshot of that was I went and see him, and I said, okay, General Osborne, do you want to, or am I going with you to Europe, or am I, or do I have the opportunity to go with the division to Europe? He said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to go with the division. He said, okay, you released me in an aid, which was good for both of us. And so he went on to Berlin, and I went, I then became the uh, 
assistant adjutant for just a little while, and then I became the uh, EXO of Headquarters Battery Division Artillery for a guy named Arthur Lombardi. Arthur Lombardi still lives down in uh, Clarksville, Tennessee, and he later was a uh, Division Artillery Commander with the, with the 101st. But Art, as the Headquarters Battery Commander exec, I went over and signed for all the property on the advance party. And uh, no, no considerable trick, because I gave the, uh, I, I took with me uh, two guys, two sergeants, three sergeants, I guess, a guy named McGinnis, who was a supply sergeant. Uh, and I took uh, the comm chief, communications chief, his name escapes me here at the moment, and uh, the operations sergeant was a guy named Westerman. And uh, we went over and signed for the headquarters battery division artillery property in advance of the arrival of the division artillery headquarters itself, like in. November, December 1955, and that... Between, um, the, between the three of you, had the inventory, all the radios, all the trucks, all the furniture, right, barracks, right. beds, foot lockers, everything. And I gave the uh, battery commander a report of survey for forty-some thousand dollars, which is sort of unheard of at the time. I mean, what, that's what it was short. Huh? Yeah. Did and you have a disinterested officer at that time, or was it just you and him? No, I did it. But I brought, I brought all the uh, standard nomen. Here's where my ordnance uh, training, for, yeah. my ordnance training had paid off. So I brought all these manuals, and I told him, I said, you got to lay this stuff out just like a manual says, lay it out. And he said, he later came to me and he said, you can't do this to me. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, because I had to take over his property in the field. You have the luxury of taking it over in garrison. I took over from relieved uh, battery commander. I said, don't tell me your story. Tell that to the sure. report of survey investigating officer. I'm just a guy counting the property right now. So these two sergeants, uh, McGinnis and the other fellow whose name I may think of, but, well, they knew everything about property. So, I mean, it was a, it was a, tremendous opportunity to learn about how to take over property. And I'd, I'd never taken over a battery before, but I knew how to inventory. And uh, yeah, well, the kids we, socked it, we socked it to the uh, Devardi commander, and then they appointed a board of officers from the division to look into it. And go, this is a hell of a thing. I mean, in those days, radio, the tears. RT-67, radio transmitter 67, which was a mainstay of the artillery at the time us 500, 600 bucks, and so 40 some thousand dollars worth of report survey made news, and uh, so I had to point a big uh, board of inquiry to find out what went on. But uh, we uh, inventoried the property, and when we met the new troops, Lombardi came in, and we turned all the property over to Lombardi, and then I became the uh, uh, assistant S2 working for two guys, one guy named uh, Lou Kraniak, who was a uh, captain, again, from the 674-187 Mafia, and uh, a guy named uh, Bert Gorowitz, who later became a brigadier general in the uh, Vietnam War, a retired brigadier general. So they were the two shop, and I became an assistant two there for six months or so. What were you doing as the two? I've seen a lot I went to school as a photo interpreter, bearing in mind I couldn't see with one eye very well. I became the only single-eyed stereo <laughs> guy in the, uh, in the industry. But I, you know, doing routine war plans. I was a okay. war plans guy and worked for a guy named in the, in the war plans game, Charlie Hall, later became a uh, lieutenant general. A guy named Joe Fant, later retired as a major general. Uh, so really had some talent now because they filled up the division talented officers at that time. We had sort of a bifurcated uh, problem. We had uh, excellent officers in the main, and we had uh, 
we didn't have the problem as much as others, but we had some really lousy troops that had been foisted off on us by the 82nd. How about the officers in the battalions and batteries? That didn't well, I wasn't in a battalion people. at the time, but uh, I later became a battery officer again right. when I went into uh, the Honest Sean business. And uh, had a terrific set of officers there. I mean, just terrific set of us. How about the ones you've been with in Fort Campbell? Did they come? Well, these were the same coterie. Same guys. And meanwhile, we're all going to the field all the time, and there's a tremendous amount of experience base. And interestingly over. enough, uh, whereas we went overseas thinking we'd get promoted in three years, we went overseas and came home without being promoted. Right. It took about five and a half years. So it took about five and a half years. So what was happening was, this group of officers who had come into the division as lieutenants in 1950, late 53 and early 54, left the division in 58 and 59 and were still lieutenants. And so the lieutenant pile had really gotten uh, field savvy. I mean, we'd done, we'd done it not once, we'd done it a hundred times. And, and there was a very high level of competency in that division when it was later sort of demobilized and, uh, and replaced by another division. And, and the 11th went off the books, went in to be the 24th. And by that time, the uh, officer content was absolutely astonishing good. So were the NCOs. After we got rid of them, now, the what happens in the saga is that Wayne Smith did not go with us to Europe as a division commander. A guy named Darrell M. Daniels did. Darrell M. Daniels had, had been the assistant division commander of the 82nd, very distinguishedly decorated in uh, World War II. And uh, he was an entomologist, PhD entomologist at uh, Clemson, gotten called up during the war, early paratrooper, I mean, he had a half a dozen silver stars, uh, very distinguished company. And he'd uh, moved up to be a division commander. And he, uh, unfortunately, had, he had this group of renegades that had been put over to us by the 82nd. And so the division uh, had its share of the troubles with the, with the Germans. It had a tremendous number of incidents. Uh, it had... Uh, famous uh, grenade in the guest house event down in Munich. I mean, it was just the, it was the terror of uh, Bavaria. Bavaria. Bavaria is what the troops call it. The terror of Bavaria. And uh, so they fired the division commander. And they, when he restricted the division, he restricted the entire division to the concerns. Uh, one weekend, and uh, I believe Wilbur Brucker was the Secretary of the Army at the time, and Wilbur Brucker fired Darrell M. Daniels as division commander and replaced him with a guy named Hugh Harris, who later would be a four-star general as the uh, commander of forces. And Hugh Harris came in and gave you another one of these cases where uh, making a several key changes, he is able to get this thing going in the right direction. Harris uh, was an old airborne soldier. Uh, he called in the provost marshal and fired him, he's a colonel. He made a captain the provost marshal told the captain that nobody could be an MP in the division unless he wore sergeant stripes and go out and levy the division for sergeants to put in to the MPs and that their duty was not to write tickets, their duty was to keep good order and discipline. Changed the whole complexion of the division. Then he called in all the uh, brigade or regimental combat team uh, commanders at the time and told them, I want you to get rid of all the riffraff. I want it gone in 30 days. We just we threw out an enormous number of people out of the army in that period of time. Once we did that, we we're perfectly okay. Was there an expeditious discharge provision you available? Bet. You bet. 
so we got rid of all the thugs. And all the battery commanders knew who the thugs were. Yeah, seems. And uh, so they were gone. I mean, uh, a guy like Vern Lewis, he, he could tell you that he had a mortar battery at that particular time. I didn't have a battery. I was up on the division artillery staff, so I can't give me any data about that. But uh, battery company commanders got rid of uh, the riffraff that essentially had come in. By that time, we knew who the good ones were on the 82nd. We threw out the riffraff, and everything was copacetic after that. We turned, out, turned around the division in a matter of uh, two months. Totally different division. When did the division become a pentomic division? Was that, in, was that part of this process, or did that come it, later? It uh, comes during this process. Okay, it so is reorganized from uh, a standard division uh, with three, three at that time, regiments and one Devardi to, to five battle groups and a Devardi. So then you could afford to have a lower strength. I was a lieutenant, and I don't know that much about that. Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't tell you what went on about that. I know that. Uh, I was wondering if you got if you threw a bunch of thugs out and got another bunch of thugs, or no, we didn't get any more thugs, and we had we 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 cleaned out the division, and from that time onward, it was, it was good shape. And so that lasted for another year, and then the second year or so, it became a, uh, a pentomic game. It went through that metamorphosis. It's probably about see we're now at fifty. This is 56 when all this is going on, so in, in 57 is when it became a pentomic division because that's when we picked up the Honest John game and I went back down to troops and went in the Honest John business. So you're in the two shop for a couple of years then, sounds like. Yeah, a little over a year. A little over. Now, the Honest John, were you, you were nuclear right yeah. from the start, weren't you? The Honest John, well, let me let me sort of try to transition there. Now I've been in the 105 battery, and uh, it was time for me to go back to troops. So I said to the uh, assignment guy, who by the way is the same guy, adjutant guy, his name is uh, Gentry. Gentry is still the adjutant. He's a different grade now, but he's been there since I. We all knew everybody. I, I could go in the officers' club and tell you all the officers in the infantry battalion. Um, we just knew everybody. And this group had been now together since 1954, 53 actually. I didn't join until 54, but now it's 56 and 7, so we, we've been there, there two and a half to three years together. So I went in to see Gentry and I said, put me in the Honest John, but that's something new. I want to learn something new. So they said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take a battery out of the uh, 544, which is our medium battery battalion. It's a 155 towed outfit. And turn it into the Anishan business. So we got this battery, and we had terrific NCOs in that thing. And we all had to go to school and learn how to do the Anishan. So we went up to uh, Swabish Kamun and learned how to operate Honest John. I came back to school here at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, Warhead School, as did all the officers. I had a symbol of Warhead and all that. And we took over the uh, battery, a guy named uh, uh, Keeley was battery commander, and we have two battery commanders, Jim Keeley. And uh, the other guy escapes my memory bank right now. Oh, Roger LeCompte. Roger LeCompte later becomes the uh, Devardi commander of the 82nd. Uh, Keeley gets out of the Army as a major and goes to work in Miami, Florida. But Keeley and, and LeCompte both were very competent, very competent field artillery officers. And uh, we, had a, we had 13 officers in this battery. Art Wells was the executive officer. He works down at MPRI. He works down at Cyprus, uh, incorporated here in Alexandria. Uh, Frank Blormo was in the battery. Uh, a guy named John Young was in the battery. All of us had, had except me, had had extensive. Pat Lowry uh, was in the battery. All of us had extensive period in the division. 
and most of everybody had extensive troop duty except me. You know, I'd had mixture. Yeah. Twelve months worth down to battery level, or fourteen months down there. But all these other guys have been executive officers in batteries, so very highly talented group of people took over this uh, on a shot out of it. Uh, and we got very good at that. Uh, because you had to do the technical delivery means business, go through all the uh, delivery or the putting together the warhead and all that kind of stuff. We had live warheads. Uh, in storage at uh, Mutlang in Germany, where they had the Pershing II missile blew up not too many years ago, in 1986. And, uh, but our warheads were stored up there, rocket motors were stored up there. We were stationed in uh, Augsburg and then uh, moved the battery down to Munich later on. But that, that was another opportunity to go to the field and get refurbished and all the skills. And the officers in the division artillery at that time, having gone there uh, for, to spend a three, full three-year tour in the NCOs, spend a full three-year tour, terrific group of people. And we all knew one another. Very high uh, rapport amongst the officers in that division. It was a hell of a division. I mean, it was a terrific division. I, I went with the uh, unit to, uh, took it to Lebanon. Uh, when we went over the Lebanese crisis in 1988, 1958. Uh, so we knew what we were doing. It was a very professional outfit, first class, after we got through the rebel rousers. What did all those 13 guys and the 13 officers in the battery do? Well, it was broken down into two platoons. And in each, I was a platoon leader. And in my platoon leader, I had, let's see if I can count the officers up right here, I had an ammo officer. His job was to go get the rocket motors and make sure we had the rocket motors and warheads in the right place. I had a nuclear weapons assembly guy. His job was to see to it that the enlisted crew and himself could do all the assembly and checkout functions for the nuclear weapons. I had a fire direction officer. Your own FDC. Huh? You had your own FDC. That's right. And I had a uh, At a second FDO, so there were two FDOs and myself. So there were five guys in the platoon. So five guys in the platoon and the battery commander and the battery exec. So there were there were twelve, I guess. Twelve officers. Did you have any survey capability in the battery? Yeah, I had survey. I had survey in the battery, but I didn't have a. Yeah, I may have had a reconnaissance survey. I was that may be the sixth guy. So I'd run something like either 13 or 14, 12 to 14 officers in the battery. But the, the platoons, in those days, the uh, Honest John was normally organized two platoon, two firing platoons per battery. Each one of the firing platoons had one launcher. But ours was a four launcher battery. You had four? Oh, and okay. So we so had, had two in your platoon. Right? We had two in each platoon. And so uh, these platoons were autonomous, and uh, and the battery commander was in the overall charge of it, and he was a captain, very senior captain. But the uh, uh, those crews were just terrific. I mean, just pretty much terrific. What did you do about chow and mechanics to fix the trucks? And all they, those all came under the uh, battery province, but when when we went to the field, they gave me part of the mess section. They gave me part of the maintenance. So I, had, I had two uh, M62 wreckers. I had four uh, five-ton extra-long wheelbase trucks, four, four uh, pole trailers to carry the rocket motors. 
and I had uh, two launchers. In other words, it was an enormously heavy equipment battery. Yeah, yeah those are big trucks. Yeah, I remember going into a field one night, stamping on the ground. It was frozen. Drove all this stuff in the field and went down to the uh, went down to the axles. Everything went down to the axles. But I said we went to went to Lebanon. It's interesting. We went to Lebanon in that uh, we got on. We tried to load out to go by air, and the uh, and the uh, Austrians and the Swiss canceled overflight rights, which meant we would have had to flown back through Germany, through France, down to Marseille, and then across the boot of uh, Italy and into. Uh, Crete or Cyprus to refuel and then over to Lebanon. This is on C-97. Uh, Globemaster. C-124s. And uh, I remember getting ready to load out in first and fell from. I've been waiting all day to load up. My turn came about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. This guy says, okay, it's your turn to load. I, he said, uh, weight on that thing again is uh, 48,000 pounds. And I said, no, weight on it's uh, 62,000 pounds, just like I told you before. So he recomputed and he said, geez, we're going to crash this thing right about uh, Crete. So he said, uh, you're not going by air, you're going by uh, sea. So we left at midnight that night. We had a Soviet liaison vehicle that went with us all the way from uh, Augsburg to uh, Bermagraven. And uh, went back across the checkpoint at the uh, start point at uh, midnight, which was my time, and there's Volkswagen was there with the Soviet liaison plates in red and yellow writing on it in Russia, Soviet Union on there. And this guy looks at his watch and he goes, right on time, right on time. <laughs> he knew your orders. He knew what I was doing. And so uh, we drove that stuff to Bremerhaven and loaded on board ship and uh, drove it through the Mediterranean, picked up a tank battalion at, uh, at uh, Cherbourg and drove it into the Mediterranean. We lost a screw, uh, which made the trip rather interminable getting through there. I remember going through the North Sea that I was the only officer on board ship on six. I became the sanitation officer. There were 2,000 troops in the hole, and there was a swill up to your uh, boot tops down there. And I remember a great big sergeant was sitting down there munching on an apple when I went down there the first morning. I said, I'm in charge of sanitation around here. And he said, yeah, I'm a sanitation NCO. He's eating an apple and this swill is sloshing around in here. And everybody had been throwing up all, all day and all night on board that ship. So that was a memorable sea voyage and I've never been on another one since then. But we got to Lebanon and then we, uh, they ordered me up to the bridge. I said, Lieutenant Thurman reports to the bridge, so I did got up there, they gave me a set of orders. They said, these are a set of seal orders for you from the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I, hell, I didn't even know the Joint Chiefs of Staff existed. And it said in there, you are to report to the air base. You are to leave all your uh, hardware loaded on board the ships that will be returned to Bremerhaven. You will report to the air base and secure passage for your troops back to uh, Germany. You will not unload any honest shot launchers uh, in Lebanon. So we went to the Olive Grove in Lebanon and stayed there several days so we could transport out because what had happened was Khrushchev said if you unload those rockets there, because everybody knew they had nuclear capability, then we will uh, we will take out selective Turkish uh, rocket sites. So uh, that was my introduction to uh, international politics at a very high level. The troops loved it, though. They had German beer within another three or four days after we got them all back there. And, and they had to go back to Bermuda and retrieve our equipment and bring it back down. But it, it, 
the division had sent a battle group over there, and uh, we were part of the team to go, and so it, it worked fine. And after we after we amalgamated with the uh, changed over from the 11th to the 24th, since the 11th was not going to be kept on the active duty rolls, uh, then I became an an aide, temporary aide for Al Watson, who came in as the new division artillery commander. Were they was that amalgamation? Was there something already there that the 11th blended with, or did it just change its name? No, we changed the name, changed the badge. So Watson, I was a temporary aide again to Al Watson when he took over. And was it getting now close to the end of the three-year life of the uh, of the division in yeah. Germany? Yeah. Or is this, as I recall it, I guess the 11th went off the roads on or about one October 19 or one January, whatever the fiscal year was in those days. I guess one January in those days. Uh, or when it's one, one July, one, 31 July. So it probably went off the rolls in uh, summer of 59. That sounds right? That sounds right. Yeah, that'd be about. Lebanon is 58, right? Yeah, about a year after so Lebanon. So it goes off the rolls in uh, late 58, early 59. And then I come home. Late '59, and go to the advanced course. By then, you are newly minted captain. By then, captain no, I made captain in September, of, as I recall, it's September of '59, and I am sort of like in transit when all that occurs. So I arrived at Fort Sill as a captain. And I then have put in charge of my first battery. I'm the battery commander, I guess, for 60 or 90 days or something, and they dissolved the battery so that I didn't have a job, and so I became the uh, billeting officer.